Today's episode of Real Ghost Stories Online is an encore presentation. We hope you enjoy the show. Hey, it's Tony Brisky from Real Ghost Stories Online. Thank you so much for listening to our program. If you want even more ghost stories, some of the best ones that we get in, then we ask that you join our EPP program, Extra Podcast Person program is what that stands for for only five dollars a month you get all of our bonus episodes more than 80 of them access to the archive of episodes that have fallen off of itunes and exclusive video content as well including our new series seeing ghosts with exclusive ghost photos that are just completely creepy it's only five dollars a month that's what keeps this show funded and on the air if you like what you hear please support us and help keep this thing going sign up at realghoststoriesonline.com and click become an epp welcome to real ghost stories online call in your real ghost story now at 855-853-4802 or write in at realghoststoriesonline.com. You are about to enter the world of the unknown, and quite possibly, the undead. This is Real Ghost Stories Online. If you have to think back on uh, what's one of the most common type places that we get stories from at Real Ghost Stories Online, where would it be? What, what common location it seems to be one of the most haunted? Think about it. Think about it. That's right. Hospitals. For whatever reason, hospitals are one of the hottest beds, if you will, of haunting activity. And on today's episode of Real Ghost Stories Online, we're going to talk with Richard Estep, author of the book World's Most Haunted Hospitals. And we're going to talk about just that, some of the most haunted hospitals in the world, why they are the most haunted, and uh, who, what, why are uh, spirits drawn to these places? It's going to be a very fascinating hour of Real Ghost Stories online, and I uh, welcome you uh, and thank you for joining us. If you're a new listener, uh, we hope you enjoy this program, and be sure to check out our archived shows as well, as uh, this is uh, one of the uh, most listened to paranormal ghost shows uh, out there today, literally Hundreds of episodes just filled with everything uh, you could possibly want in the world of paranormal. You can find more about that on our website, realghoststoriesonline.com. Uh, let's get right into our interview today with uh, Richard Estep. Uh, he is a professional paranormal investigator, several years uh, behind doing that. But uh, I will, I'll let you explain your background a little bit, Richard, and uh, what brought you into the world of the paranormal. Sure. Well, I've had a lifelong fascination with all things paranormal. Ever since I can remember as a boy, I was that kid that when everybody else was out running around playing sports, I would be uh, reading the books that I got from the library about uh, haunted houses and <laughs> ghost stories, you know, starting with the junior stuff, but then going on to some of the weightier books by guys like Peter Underwood and, and Harry Price and some of the American authors, you know, the Warrens. So I've always had a... Sorry. I've always had a fascination with stuff like that. Okay. Um, it's always um, been something I've been desperately interested in. And my grandparents' house was haunted when I was growing up, so they had told me some great first-hand ghost stories that I just was fascinated by. Did you have any experiences yourself in your grandparents' house uh, that were paranormal? You know, I did not have any experiences myself, but it wasn't for lack of, of looking. And I used to... <laughs> I used to lie awake at night terrified that I would encounter the resident um, apparition, which was an old lady that had put my, my stepdad and his um, brothers and sisters into bed at night. Oh. Uh, and she was, a, yeah, she was a very kind of friendly ghost, although it would have, I think if I'd actually met her at that age, it would have scared the pants off of me, you know? Yeah. But uh, <laughs> she seemed to be in residence for as long as there were children in that house. And once they grew up and left and had families of their own, mm -hmm. uh, the apparition stopped coming around. Very much like a caregiver type ghost. Yeah, absolutely. A very kind of um, maternal mm -hmm. caring ghost. That's a type that you, that you want to have. If you have a ghost, if you have to pick, you know, who's going to be haunting the house, that would be the good one to have. Until one day you realize, oh, it uh, has a third eye and it happens to be red. What's going on here? <laughs> <laughs> well, let's talk about uh, your your book here, World's Most Haunted Hospitals. I want to ask you this, first off, how, how do you define what hospitals are the most haunted? 
that's the best question yet, and it's one that um, that you really can't answer easily. So calling it the world's most haunted hospital, to be honest, was the publisher's idea. Not that I was against it, but you're making a pretty bold claim. Mm -hmm. Because as you say, how do you define something so subjective? Do you look at a case like, for example, St. Thomas's Hospital in London, which has a very well-documented um, gray lady that goes back generations. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got a, a haunting that is well over a century, consistently old. Or do you go to places that have um, hundreds, if not thousands of deaths listed in them, uh, and you see kind of bursts of, of paranormal activity. Mm -hmm. and it's, so it's, there's a degree of subjectivity there, Tony, to tell you the truth. Sure. I just, I didn't know if there was a certain, uh, you know, way you were ranking it or not, but a lot of times the publishers, that's what they do. They come up with the, uh, the, the title, it's going to stand out the most, and uh, it certainly does. Now, when we think about a haunted hospital, and we get, we literally get thousands of stories on this show every yeah. single year from all different types of hospital environments, whether it be, you know, an abandoned asylum, which is what, you know, everybody pictures when they think of haunted hospital. Mm -hmm. But we also get a lot of stories uh, that, that come from, you know, active facilities, whether it be a nursing home, whether it just be a, a small clinic of some sort. It's, it's not always the creepy abandoned places that have spirits in it, is it? And I don't think that that's, that's even a fact of the creepiness of it, as much as it's I mean, that's, that's psychological. Mm -hmm. But I've said many times that when it comes down to a hospital, and you can pick any hospital, pick a busy metropolitan hospital, pick one that's in downtown New York or Chicago or London, wherever. Mm -hmm. And if you look at a typical year in the life of a modern hospital, let's say, mm -hmm. you see the entire spectrum of human drama played out on that stage. And so in one part of the hospital, you have joy, you have new life coming into the world, you have babies being delivered families that are being augmented, you know, it's terrific. And that's very intense emotion. Mm -hmm. And then just not that far away, you have lives that are coming to a close. So in some of the longer term care facilities, you know, facilities in the hospital, you have people that have lived 60, 70, 80 years and are breathing their last. And you get grief, you get sadness. And then there's the emergency room where you have lives that are ending unexpectedly most of the time and sometimes violently. And all of that is within this relatively small amount of space. Mm -hmm. And how could that not leave its mark on the environment? You know, you really, you just almost answered my next question, but I want to expand upon it. And that question was, uh, why is it that hospitals are a hotbed for activity? And, and you just explained it all. I mean, it's very much because of what is going on, all of those emotions and the extreme range of all of it. I guess what I want to ask, though, is, Okay, so all of these emotions are being expelled in this one place. Why are they staying there? The the spirit, you mean? Yeah. Why is it that you know? Obviously, these things happen, but in a lot of cases, especially you know, if if it didn't end in 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 death, and even when it does end mm -hmm. in death, the people aren't typically buried on the property. Uh, if it's mm -hmm. a newborn baby, they go off and they live their life in a their home. Why is it that so many, uh, so much of this energy, so much of, of these entities or so many of these entities seem to stay in the hospital? That's a great question. And one of the hospitals that I investigated, um, uh, an old hospital outside Salt Lake City in Utah, uh, there, was, there were multiple reports by visiting psychic mediums. There were multiple reports of, there were multiple reports of, um, uh, excuse me, uh, a traffic cop, if you will, and that's the term I'm using, of course, as an analogy. Mm -hmm. It was uh, a nurse, the spirit of a nurse, that was actually helping to direct um, those that had passed on. Supposedly she acted to send them on into the next life. The implication being that they needed some kind of help getting there. You know, So I do wonder if the, the spirit, some of them may not be earthbound, just because of the intensity of emotion that's going on in that location. Mm -hmm. That that makes sense. Who who comes back to haunt these places? Do you see a, an increase in in whether it be patients or staff or both? What what have, what have you found? It was it was definitely a mixture of both. Um, and one thing that I think is I've seen very commonly researching the book is you look at many medical providers and they don't see it as a job. They see it as a calling or a vocation. You mm -hmm. know, it's not even a profession. Not to denigrate having a profession, but it's a calling. It's, they're naturally healers. And these are the kind of people that regularly work unpaid overtime. You know, 
that regular in tough situations and that go above and beyond. Sure. Um, and I think it's that kind of mentality, that kind of healer mentality, or I should probably call it healer spirit, if you will, um, that draws the employees back. And I've seen a number of cases in which doctors, nurses, even an x-ray technician um, have been reported both in, in terms of apparitions and EDPs at the hospitals where they once worked in life. And then you have those patients as well that uh, do seem to be earthbound there. And I think they return or, or they stay in residence less voluntarily. Mm -hmm. I was going to ask, I mean, it, it makes sense for to me anyway, as far as the staff sticking around, because it's one of those things where, and this is true in almost any career um, or, or vocation, if it's something you're extremely passionate about, if it's something that is is literally an extension of you, it's mm -hmm. it, it, you you do seem to see more of, of an activity, or or at least you know retrospectively, you tend to see uh, more activity within those sort of buildings or locations where those those jobs are being practiced by the people who were the practitioners of of those those jobs and those those careers. Um, then you do so much, you know a fast food employee. I mean, obviously, there's not many people who are, you know, very much, you know, that is what I was called to do. It's, it's very mm -hmm. much the things that are, this is me. This is my life. It will be my life until I die. And off, oftentimes even then after. So that led me to my next question of, uh, about the patients. And you had just said mm -hmm. it too, that maybe they're not so much there by choice. And I was going to ask, are mm -hmm. they there by choice? And if they're not, why? Why are they there, and, and, and what, what is keeping them there? Well, I think that, that, just to piggyback on what you said before that, by the way, you're absolutely correct. Um, I've seen a number of haunted firehouses in my career, and as a firefighter, that's, again, a, a, prof a profession. Yeah. It's something you are 24-7, and there's a lot of emotion attached to that family atmosphere. Sure. So to answer your last question, though, um, I'm not entirely sure that all of them are earthbound in the sense we understand it. I do wonder if some come back in visitation, uh, but for those that are seemingly permanently in residence, there are a number of factors that might be at play, and one could easily be unresolved issues, mm -hmm. which again is a fairly common um, motivation, isn't it, when we see a case of a long-term haunting. In fact, going back to the very earliest ghost stories we have recorded, uh, these unresolved issues are absolutely reasons that a spirit can stay earthbound. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a large part of it. Just the unresolved issues. Do you, do you think that that they they are aware that they are stuck? Do you think that a lot of them are aware that they are even dead? Because we, we hear so many cases, and and it seems to be more common in in a hospital uh, setting, mm -hmm. but more so like in a, a, an assisted living or a, an end of life care yeah. type facility, where we hear the stories of someone who resided in a certain room for a couple years before they passed yeah. and then their daily activities whether it be the blanket gets folded in this mm -hmm. specific way or whatever it be it continues to repeat itself after they're gone sure and it's a question of is there any intelligence there yeah. are we truly intelligent or is it more residual yeah and i know i, I encountered some cases uh, again looking at some of the london hospitals one that i won't forget that was really quite sad and yet also helpful, is a nurse who um, found herself in a position that no medical professional should ever be in ethically, where she was caring for her own uh, fiancé. Uh, she was his nurse, and she accidentally overdosed him with morphine, oh. <clears throat> and he died. Mm -hmm. And so what's interesting about this particular um, apparition is she's said to appear and nurses see her, whenever narcotics are being given, pain medication. And it's almost as though she's still beating herself up emotionally over this single error that she made that ended so badly. Mm -hmm. And she's coming back to say to the, the newest generations of nurses, hey, don't be like me. Check your dose more carefully. You know, Don't make this mistake because mm -hmm. I'm still paying for it a uh, century later. It's almost as if she's coming back to be a help in, in the hospital. It, it is, but also the affect is very me melancholy, you know. Mm -hmm. You're right, she is being beneficial. But it's it's also very sad that, you know, forgiveness is, is, is something I think we all need to be better at and we could all work harder at. But if you can't forgive yourself after that amount of time, you know, it's a very sad thing. Yeah. How long should you continue to pay yourself for a mistake that was honestly made? And how can how could someone like that be helped to eventually cross over 
if they're sitting yes, there still still doing that. Yeah, I, I, I guess that also kind of leads me to the thought of, you know, sometimes you can have things like that where they are trying to be a help, trying to almost make, in this case, obviously, others aware of, of what sort of error, what, what the result of an error could be uh, if, if someone's mm-hmm. not paying close enough attention. Could these things ever be a danger or are they ever a danger to the living, especially in, in a setting like a hospital where things are very much life and death? And if something gets screwed up, if something is, is not attended to correctly or, or misjudged or misguided, uh, can obviously have catastrophic results. Well, you know, I've spoken to um, a lot of medical providers in the course of researching the book and just generally over my own uh, 15-year career as a paramedic and an EMT. Uh, most hospitals do not like to talk about their ghost stories. They don't. And I absolutely understand why. Because the hospital is supposed to be a, a calm place of rest and recuperation, you know, and you can't do that if you're if you're scared of the resident spook, if you will. Sure. Um, but if you do get uh, to talk off the record, to people that work in hospitals, especially those that work in palliative care, there are a lot of these stories. And virtually none of them, um, at least in, in currently operating hospitals, are negative. When you see the negative stories, the ones that are darker and a little bit more frightening, mm-hmm. um, they tend to be in places that are abandoned. And a good example of that is the, um, the air base in the Philippines that used to be Clark Field, Clark Air Base. Okay. Uh, that was abandoned by the U.S. military after a volcano erupted and just dumped ash on the entire place. Oh, They've since renovated large parts of it, the runway is usable again. But the hospital, which was state of the art at the time, uh, is still in ruins. And I interviewed Barry Fitzgerald, an Irish paranormal investigator that was a member of the Ghost Hunts International team. Mm-hmm. And Barry said that there is something elemental down in the basement there. Um, and he said that I could not write him a big enough check to spend one more night in that building. <laughs> That, that really says something. It does. And yet I think it's independent of the hospital's role. You know, I think that happened to do with the ground that was there many years before the hospital was built sure. in the middle of the 20th century. Yeah. That, that, I mean, well, that, you have that, that sort of phenomenon, that sort of issue with homes all the time, too, depending on where a home was built. It, you know, I suppose it could be applicable to a business, a hospital, whatever it is. Uh, what sort of ground are you building on? What was there before? And was it meant for use as anything other than, uh, for example, a burial site? Hmm. It's a valid point, indeed. We tend to look at, especially with newer buildings, we look at the modern hospital and they're very shiny. You know, they're glass, they're perspex, they're stainless steel. They look very high-tech in 21st century. Mm-hmm. But you have to look at the location that they were built on. Are hospitals, especially modern hospitals by nature, are they almost a battery for the paranormal with the amount of electronic medical equipment, very powerful at times, mm-hmm. that are you know pulsating throughout them? Uh, you know, I always think of this when people ask about, because uh, obviously I'm in radio, um, you know, a haunted radio station. I have so many stories of those, but, you know, it almost makes mm. sense. You have transmitters, you have this, you have that. Yeah. Very much, I, I think of it just the, the energy that something can feed off of. A radio station is a great place, as would be a hospital, I would think, at least a modern that's, hospital. That's an, that's an excellent point. Um, and you're right, I've heard of a number of haunted radio and TV stations, too. And you look at the energy that's generated there, it's kind of understandable. So with a hospital, you have multiple types of, of power sources. Mm-hmm. You have the electrical power source, which is, you know, the, the actual mechanics of fueling the activity. And again, you have that emotional power source. You have that intense emotion. And wherever one finds intense emotion, you see ghosts, yeah. uh, be it a battlefield, you know, or be it um, a family residence or murder scene, those kind of situations. I think a hospital hits it from both angles. Has there ever been uh, that you're aware of a documented, maybe probably not documented, but but a a story that you have heard, and probably somewhat off the record, um, as far as uh, a, a ghost or entity or or something, whatever you want to call it, something unexplained, something paranormal, something mm-hmm. supernatural, causing a problem with uh, w- with the health of a patient, whether it be in a, a surgical procedure, whether it just be medication whether it be something of that nature but they couldn't explain 
what was going wrong other than there was something supernatural or paranormal involved? I'm, I'm not aware of anything along those lines causing a negative outcome or being detrimental to patient care, no. Um, I'm, I'm not saying it has never happened. I'm just sure. saying I'm not aware of it. Uh, I mean, th there are a number of cases, and there was a hospital in the UK, I don't recall the name, but uh, it they actually had uh, intervention from the clergy because they were seeing a, a black figure walking through the operating room, and it was basically frightening the people that worked there. Sure. So I think that's that's really as far as it goes. Um, but no, I haven't heard of any, any negative outcomes, and I'm glad. Yeah, I was just going to say, it's probably a good uh, question not to really have a story behind, because <laughs> that could be a, a little a little too frightening. Mm. If you were to, uh, to to be in in a hospital, an active hospital, and I'm talking, mm -hmm. you know, your, your shiny modern-day hospital, whether it be a new building mm -hmm. or whether it just be an old building that's been revamped, where would one most likely go in the hospital to find a ghost? Oh, that's a great question. I, I recently moved into one for a week. Oh. Um, and it was the one in Salt Lake City that I was mentioning, uh, simply because that's going to be the basis for my next book, which is out in August. Okay. And I wanted to tell the story of that haunting from start to finish. It was such an involved and complex case. Yeah. Uh, and, and so we hit all of the departments of this old community hospital, and we focused um, our attention on the emergency room initially. You know, which made a lot of sense, and that, that had a documented apparition of an ER doctor in there. Um, the, the labor and delivery, or the OBGYN um, area, also had a lot of documented activity. And some of it was intelligent and interactive, and some of it was residual. Mm -hmm. So there had been lots of reports of hearing the crying of babies, you know, and, and also hearing the more mundane sounds of um, the PA system and, and people being paged. They have one very memorable. EVP in that hospital, and it sounds exactly as if somebody is paging a physician, um, except, of course, it was done in an empty room with no power turned on. Oh, so OBGYN and um, uh, the emergency room is where I most uh, focused my attention, and those are my crew. Why would you say it is that specific area of the hospital? What would the reasoning behind it be? Well, again, it keeps coming back to the emotions. You mm -hmm. know, you see a lot of emotions in both of those um, areas of the hospital. Sure. Uh, the emergency room, you have a lot more stress. You have a lot more tension. You have a lot more of the negative aspects. And uh, OBGYN, labor and delivery, you have a lot more joy. You know, and you have this new life entering the world. And you have families that are just so relieved everything went okay. There is occasionally still, of course, a death in childbirth, even with yeah. modern medicine. But for the most part... It's a procedure. It's a an area of medicine where you know it's a it's a beautiful thing, sure. and and that creates, I think, a different kind of emotional energy in that area. I agree. I mean, and, and that's that's true. I mean, you do think of it being happy and and you know very joy filled area, but at the same point too, I mean, you do have a mixture. I mean, it, it's it's usually mm -hmm. going to be one extreme or the other mm -hmm. in that room as far as what people are and, experiencing. And, and, and one interesting um, code to that is having talked to the owners of the hospital, there is a, um, a resident ghost within the OBGYN area of the hospital there that um, is, is a young lady that lost her baby in childbirth. Mm -hmm. And she, w whenever psychics come through, whenever mediums have described her on the tour, she's always crying, she's in tears, she's very emotionally distraught. And she's able to transfer that emotion to anybody visiting who is either pregnant or has just had a baby. And quite regularly on the tours that they give of this hospital, they actually recommend that new mothers or pregnant women don't go in that section, that they avoid it. Sure. And those that, that don't heed the advice, more than a few, have been overcome with just sudden intense sadness and despair without knowing why. And this is before they're told the story of this, um, of this spirit. No. Oh. It's good that they they warned them to stay out, obviously, especially, you know, someone who is expecting or a new mother to, to suddenly have to experience that with all the other things that are going on and, and just getting re-regulated with, with emotions to have that thrown into the mix. That could be very scary. Agreed. Uh, as far as, here, here's an interesting thing I, I was wondering about, too, because we get a lot of stories uh, where, and I shouldn't say a lot, we get some stories about what I would basically call a living ghost, and it kind of goes back to the world of astral projection. 
where yeah. we have stories of people who are in a in a dream state, if you will, and they are dreaming they are in a different place. We said a story the other day about a woman who was dreaming she was back at, at her childhood home in the backyard, uh, oh. and and she it was dreaming that she saw this family having a campfire in the backyard and mm -hmm. uh, was looking at a tree that she was fond of as a child. She went to go visit that home a couple weeks later, just out of curiosity, asking if she could take a picture of this tree that she was so fond of. And the owners of the home, the children there, freaked out because they saw her and they said, that's the ghost we saw in the woods the other night when we oh. were having the campfire. And completely unbeknownst to this woman, she was just thinking she was dreaming that she was there, but she was physically projecting herself. I'm wondering how often that happens in a hospital, especially with people who are kind of in, kind of out of a lucid sure. state. Um, all of the emotions that are, are, are being experienced, I would think it would also be a hotbed for things of that nature to be happening, where people are seeing other people thinking it's a ghost, thinking it's it's something of that nature, where maybe it's it's Susie, you know, Q from room 244 projecting herself across the hospital, you know, to the the cafeteria. I don't know. How have you ever had any any cases of that or any stories of that where it sure. turns out it really wasn't a ghost but more sure. so a projection? Uh, personally, I mean, it, it's happened to my my own apparition has been seen. Really? If you um yeah, I'll tell you that story in just a moment, but if you look back at the um, the history of our profession of paranormal research, the big SPR study, the Society for Psychical Research, that was conducted um, around about the turn of the century, a lot of the apparitions that were documented were apparitions of the living. Mm -hmm. We sim we simply have we hear ghosts, we hear apparition. That term we have it mentally. Um, we're, we're now wired to think, oh yeah, that's a dead person. Yeah, but but we forget that that's not the case a lot of the time. So the, the, the time it happened to me was um, in a cell block in a prison at Cripple Creek in Colorado. We were doing a charity investigation, um, and this is the original jail for the town of Cripple Creek, and they've now enclosed it and made it a museum. And it's a very emotionally charged atmosphere already when you walk in. There is graffiti going back hundreds of years carved into the walls. Things like, they took my baby away from me is, is carved into one of the walls. It just mm -hmm. breaks your heart to read it. Yeah. And so uh, I, I made a point of being um, secured in one of the jail cells with another investigator standing in the doorway. And uh, a third investigator came upstairs to the top of the cell block, could hear his footsteps coming along the uh, outside the doors, turned into my cell and jumped halfway out of his skin when he saw me. And he said, how did you get back in here so fast? And I said, well, what do you mean, Sean? I've been here for 20 minutes, half an hour. Mm -hmm. He said, no, no, there's no way. You were just outside. I saw you. You were taking photographs on the balcony outside. And I said, Sean, I've been under guard in here for the last, you know, half hour, basically. There's no way out of this cell but through that door, which is, which somebody is standing in. Yeah. And so, and so what's interesting about that is um, he, he described me and said, I know what you look like. This was absolutely 100% you. However, you were wearing a different shirt. That was the only thing that was different. It was a different colored shirt. He described a brown shirt. I was wearing a blue team uniform shirt at the time. He said everything else about it was 100% you. So what is going on in a case like that? Because it wasn't like you were taking a nap or, or out of it mm -hmm. or, 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 or thinking about going and taking pictures or doing the actions he was describing. What was he seeing? Well, that's a great question. And one one part of me thinks it was something that was mimicking my appearance. Okay. Which which had happened to me before at Waverly Hills. Not my appearance, but my voice. Sure. Um, my voice had been heard coming out of the body shoot at Waverly Hills <laughs> when I was up on the roof at the other end of the building. There's no way it could have been my voice carrying deep underground. Mm -hmm. You know, so there was a certain possibility that I was being mimicked. But there's another intriguing um, potential here that, uh, that, that somebody brought up. I forget who it was. But it's, it's fascinating to me. I'm due to go back to that same location in two weeks' time, spend another night in the cell there investigating. What if I decide to wear a brown shirt this time? Mm -hmm. Thinking about it then, you've, you've got this intriguing possibility of is it some kind of interdimensional thing? Is it yeah. some kind of time slip, you know? Um, part of me wants to do that just to... <laughs> 
you know, it, it's like those time travel movies where yeah. you do something that, that is set up for an earlier event. Yeah, and, and they, for whatever reason, they were seeing you, but it was at a different place in time. And for whatever mm-hmm. reason, that's how it presented itself at that location. So many possibilities there, obviously, a topic we're never really going to know the true answers to, Mm -hmm. but it's so fascinating to to discuss what they might be. I want to hear about, uh, let's go with like your, your, your top four haunted hospital uh, stories that you have from, from investigating the book or just from your experiences being a paranormal investigator. Let's start like with, you know, what you could imagine, you know, at number four, all the way to number one being the most impactful, the the most amazing that you've you've ever experienced. Well, I think some of my um, one of the cases that's not in the book is Waverly Hill Sanatorium. Okay. Um, uh, purely not in there because the owners did not want to be included in the book. Okay. Um, but uh, I investigated that place for a night. I spent an evening there with my team, and again, my uh, my voice was heard by two investigators coming out of the body chute when I was quite far away and up on the roof. Uh, and that was the same night that some footsteps had followed my wife upstairs on an empty staircase. Yeah. So that was fascinating. Um, the other three involved the hospital that I moved into. This is in World's Most Haunted Hospital. Okay. It's a place called the Old Tuella Community Hospital in Tuella, Utah. Okay. And it's now a Halloween haunted house style attraction called Asylum 49. Oh, jeez. The, the folks that bought it, and, and if that's not enough, it's built next to the cemetery. It's directly back onto the cemetery. And the rear of the building is a separate um, business, and it is a nursing home for senior citizens. Did they so – uh, you have – Were, were, were the, the people who were buying it, were they aware of its true haunted history? I think that when, when uh, Kim Anderson, the gentleman that, uh, that first bought it, along with um, a couple of other folks – he was, he'd heard a couple of stories, but didn't think that much of it. He just thought, how cool would it be to have a haunted house attraction that's, um, you know, a hospital? Sure. And this, this place has been on TV. If you saw the Stephen King uh, miniseries, The Stand, yeah. this played the Boulder Community Hospital in that TV series. Okay. So, yeah, so, you know, it kind of is a great place. And they've shot music videos there and a number of things. So it's spooky purely because when this place closed down at the beginning of the 21st century, they just moved out and left everything there. So it has the original patient bed. It has x-ray machines. Mm-hmm. It has an ER with all the equipment in it. It really is a hospital that looks like people just left one day, closed the doors, and moved out. Yeah. And so when they, uh, when they purchased this place, now most of the walls are covered in blood spray. You turn into any dark corner and you'll find a zombie or a werewolf or some kind of nasty creature sculpted in latex that's designed to give you a scare. Mm-hmm. You know? And the place is absolutely riddled with um, ghosts. And so I'd, I'd gone initially there to, to investigate the book for World's Most Haunted Hospitals and had a fairly quiet night, although I, I enjoyed going through their archive of, of anomalous photographs and of EVPs. And the owner said, you know, the problem is you came here uh, in the spring. This is off season for us. We're just doing construction. Mm-hmm. They said, well, this place is hopping when it's active is October. We have over 30,000 people a year come through here. And that's when the spirits are at their most active. And sometimes they will participate in the haunt. And I learned this myself, oh, God. Uh, as I'll tell you in just a minute. Yeah. So I said, okay, well, how about I move in for a week and bring a team with me? I'll bring, uh, I'll bring some paranormal investigators. I'll bring some, bring some paramedics. How about that? And they said, knock yourself out. So I did. Uh, and we had the most incredible time as we were investigating this place. So uh, a good example, probably my third story here would be, we were having a spirit box session. I'm sure you're familiar with those and your listeners are. Sure. Where outside one of the rooms in the corridor, which was a room um, that had been occupied in life by a patient with Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. And the phenomena in this room tends to be either kind of friendly, welcoming, or it tends to be very aggressive and angry, which you can see with that type of patient, you know? Mm -hmm. And we were getting voices through the spirit box. My name came through the spirit box. Uh, and then followed by, it's a word for a part of the anatomy that everybody has, uh-huh. if you know what I mean, that we sit on. Sure. So that was kind of interesting. And uh, one of the investigators there was my uh, a friend of mine is a paramedic, and this was her daughter. It was her first investigation ever, first case. Mm-hmm. And so she was a nice, impartial observer. Well, we have this very, 
I would have to say that it was an abusive interaction on the spirit box. It was saying some sexually suggestive things to one of the female nurses in our team. Mm -hmm. So things got a little bit heated coming through the spirit box. After that, we investigated until daylight. Um, a bunch of us went back to our hotels. And as soon as I closed my hotel door, I got a text from um, the paramedic and said, this is a photograph of my daughter's shoulder. She just took off her shirt. And there were three long, straight, what you could only describe as deep scratches running down the length of her shoulder, down her back. Oh, jeez. Three. Yeah. Um, and, and having talked to a couple of friends of mine who are in the clergy, they said, you know, it doesn't really matter what, what you believe or don't, but in Christian circles, we tend to believe that three is the sign of something demonic when you see this kind of activity. Mm -hmm. It mocks the Holy Trinity. Sure. She felt, yeah, she felt no pain at the time, no discomfort, no burning, scratching, itching, nothing. But they'd been visible as soon as she took off her shirt to get a shower at the end of the night, and her mom had noticed them. Yeah, that is just, when you get that, I mean, did, they, did she continue on, or was that the end of the investigation there? You know, I would have been absolutely 100% understanding if she said, I'm done, this is not for me, yeah. no thank you. But she stayed gamely on until the end. And oh. there is a wing of this hospital which the negative energy seems to be concentrated in. It has a, uh, a spirit present that the staff called the Guardian. Mm -hmm. They've nicknamed him the Guardian, which sounds like a very protective, friendly name, actually, but it is. Uh, he's called that because in life, according to psychic mediums that have visited the hospital, uh, in life, he was supposed to be the, the guardian of secrets. He liked to know everybody's business, and the, the, the less legitimate it was, the better. You know, He liked to have stuff on the same location where uh, a Salt Lake City uh, news journalist was, said, take me into his area, let me go see what I can find out, and was shoved so forcefully against the wall that he left the asylum and never came back. <laughs> And the female investigators there specifically, or staff members, volunteers, don't go into his area alone. He tends to, uh, as a male spirit, tends to be very predatory towards female visitors, touching them inappropriately and shoving them, pushing them around. Wow. With, with a, a, a building like that where it has so many different facets to it, is this the same one that you said that also has a uh, an elderly care now added to it, or was that the previous building? No, this is the same location. Same location. Okay, with with that, because I I've, we're, I'm seeing a lot of that, especially with some of these older buildings that that had been abandoned for quite some time, um, mm -hmm. now being revamped and turned into uh, all sorts of uh, interesting things that uh, not are all are not always uh, uh, care facilities, but sometimes uh, a facet of them becomes an elder care part. Mm -hmm. uh, are you hearing any stories of uh, of activity within, like, the elder care part of, of, of the, the the facility? So I have another question about uh, that right after, right after you answer that. Well, I'd, I'd be careful about answering it because it, it's still a, a working retirement facility. But sure. They are relocating that part of the building. Oh. Um, but you can actually see that answer for yourself because this uh, location was covered on an episode of Ghost Adventures. Okay. Um, and on that episode, Zach Bagans and his folks actually interviewed some of the nursing staff in the nursing home, and they had been very clear to him about the fact that they have all kinds of activity going on in the home as well. Okay. So I'd, I'd encourage your listeners to get more info on that, to go watch the Ghost Adventures episode that covers the old Tuella Hospital. Sure. Are you familiar at all with the, uh, and I want to hear your other your other two stories, are you familiar at all with the uh, the building that was once the Traverse City State Hospital? I'm not in uh, in Traverse City, Michigan. That's a good one to look at um, uh, on this topic. I lived up there several years ago, and I, right when I was moving, um, they were revamping it, and it was a a state hospital used, uh, you know, for all you know, different purposes. A lot of of you know mental care facility and things of that yeah. nature, but very gothic looking building, multiple buildings, large campus. Uh, but abandoned for many years, and it was the one of the spookiest looking buildings I'd ever seen. It, it's now uh, called Traverse City Commons, and they've turned it into. Uh, there's an elder care facility. There's gourmet restaurants. There's boutique shopping in it, and it looks like you're walking into a Stephen King movie. Um, it, yeah. and, and I give them credit because it's a very ornate, very beautiful building, but very very spooky. And it's amazing what they've 
they've done with this thing. And, you know, I give him credit for not just tearing it down, which I think that's what everyone thought would eventually happen. But we've gotten stories from former staff there uh, of of activity and things of that nature. Uh, I had uh, been there, like I said, right when they were at the beginning of revamping it. And I, I didn't even know it existed until a friend of mine uh, invited me to dinner at this restaurant there. Pulled in at night, very, very dark, very dimly lit, felt like something out of The Exorcist. And there in the basement uh, was this, you know, like three, four-star gourmet restaurant. And you, the rest of the building, broken out windows and just abandoned, just at the very beginning stages of, of fixing it up. But the restaurant looked, you know, like a, an interesting place. All fixed up, but still keeping the character of the the. Uh, the stone and rock and uh, all the way down to your dining table is in what would have been a room, although it resembled more of a cell than a room, uh, complete with uh, like metal, uh, what would have been where a, a chain of some sort uh, came out of that was still attached to the wall. And you can only imagine the individuals who would have been in those rooms attached by chain to that. And there you are enjoying some seared salmon. Uh, it's, it was just a very, very bizarre experience. I personally did not have anything happen to me there, but, um, I would certainly, uh, recommend taking a look at that one. I know, uh, maybe kind of they don't necessarily like to advertise, you know, haunting or anything there, but, sure. but there are certainly people around that can tell stories of that location. Well, and that segues nicely into another story about uh, a location in the book. The Linda Vista Hospital in California, um, which has been, again, it's kind of a Hollywood hospital. They shot episodes of ER Mm -hmm. in that hospital when it was abandoned, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, a lot of TV shows Mm -hmm. um, at Linda Vista. And this is where uh, Nick Gross, uh, he's pretty well known as a TV paranormal investigator, had his encounter with the apparition of a nurse, one that looked at him. She looked... um, he looked at her, she looked at him. He absolutely convinced that she was aware of him, mm-hmm. that she was interactive. Uh, and he said it's one of the things that has made the biggest impact on him through his entire year, uh, career, many years investigating the paranormal. And so Linda Vista now is no longer a hospital, it's no longer a movie set. They've made it into um, senior citizens' apartment. It's just, so not quite assisted living, but apartments. Wow. And I do kind of wonder what stories if you were to ask, they're coming out of those apartments. I would wonder. I would very much wonder. Let's hear your other uh, your other uh, stories as far as uh, th- that make your top list of some of the, 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 the most haunted hospitals or scariest experiences there. Well, I think one of my favorite ones came, uh, again, when I interviewed the guys from Ghost Hunters International and talked about uh, one of their locations out in the Philippines. We talked about Clark Air Base a little bit just a few minutes ago, but... Um, One of the security guards had an experience there when he was patrolling at night. He encountered uh, what he's convinced is the apparition of a U.S. serviceman, um, completely wearing his uniform, if you will. And this particular hospital was the first stop for casualties coming back from Vietnam Mm. during the 60s and 70s. So you had a lot of um, physically and emotionally traumatized American servicemen coming through, you know, to, to get medical care, and then they returned to the U.S. mainland. And so this particular apparition that he encountered had a black area where his face should have been. Mm-hmm. And according to the security guard uh, testimony, the security guard was smoking, and the, the apparition gestured as in, hey, give me a cigarette. And so the, the guard says that he did hand over his cigarette, which was lit. The apparition took it and then disappeared into thin air right before his eyes. Wow. Taking the cigarette with him? Taking the cigarette with him. <laughs> That's, I mean, that, I mean, you, you think of that like from happening in a movie, but when you're talking about it happening, you know, in real life, that, mm-hmm. that, that, that leads to many other questions of how did it take something physical with it like that? Mm-hmm. Well, and, that, and that's right. It, it's certainly a branch of physics we don't understand, but... yeah. Pretty much all of the paranormal literature, you have stories of, of ghosts opening doors, some of them being solid, touching people, being touched. Mm-hmm. So there is some form of energy and interplay there that we don't understand yet. Yeah. There's so many questions that 
arise. I mean, I, I always say this, uh, just from doing this for so long now, I, I have so many more questions now than I did when I started uh, talking on this subject. You know, I, I may be able to, to, to give more opinions and have more ideas, but I, I am still as far from an expert on the topic as anyone. And I don't think really anyone is. It's more so just about reiterating the experiences that we have or that we learn about uh, and, and able to provide more perspective. But ultimately, that just ends up leading to more and more questions than anything else. The more you learn, I think, in this field, the, the more you realize you still have to learn. And for every answer we get, it raises more questions. It, it truly, truly does. With this new book that you're working on, can you talk about that a little bit? So the new book is, we just completed it, actually. It's called The Haunting of Asylum 49. It's due out on August 22nd um, in the U.S. and worldwide. And it basically covers in more detail the haunting of Asylum 49. Okay. Um, and I wanted to actually live on site. I wanted to be there around the clock, you know, and spend more time than just a night or two uh, delving into its secrets, interviewing the people that work there, interviewing the owners, looking at its history ever since it fell into private hands, and some of the uh, more interesting paranormal experiences there. It sounds like a great book. When it, when it comes out here uh, later in the year, would you come back on the show again to talk about it? I'd be delighted to come back on and uh, talk about it then. I'd love to have you back on then. Thank you so much for talking with us today about uh, World's Most Haunted Hospitals. It's been very fascinating. It's been a pleasure and a privilege. Thank you very much. There you go. That wraps up today's episode of Real Ghost Stories Online. If you uh, like the show, please consider supporting it, helping us stay on the air. Become an EPP, get access to uh, 80-some bonus episodes just jam-packed with some of the best ghost stories that we ever get in. You can sign up to be an EPP on our website, realghoststoriesonline.com. Click Become an EPP. Of course, more extras with that as well, including exclusive video material and more. You won't regret it. Great stuff up there, so check that out and help keep this thing going. Until next time, for Jenny Bruski, I'm Tony Bruski. Thank you for listening to another episode of Real Ghost Stories Online. You know, sometimes you can have things like that where they are trying to be a help, trying to almost make, in this case, obviously, others aware of of what sort of error, what what the result of an error could be uh, if, if someone's mm-hmm. not paying close enough attention. Could these things ever be a danger or are they ever a danger to the living, especially in, in a setting like a hospital where things are very much life and death? And if something gets screwed up, if something is is not attended to correctly or or misjudged or misguided, uh, can obviously have catastrophic results. Well, you know, I've spoken to um, a lot of medical providers in the course of researching the book and just generally over my own uh, 15-year career as a paramedic and an EMT. And most hospitals do not like to talk about their ghost stories. They don't. And I absolutely understand why, because the hospital is supposed to be a, a calm place of rest and recuperation, you know, and you can't do that if you're, if you're scared of the resident spook, if you will. Sure. Um, but if you do get uh, to talk off the record to people that work in hospitals, especially those that work in palliative care, there are a lot of these stories. And virtually none of them, um, at least in, in currently operating hospitals, are negative. When you see the negative stories, the ones that are darker and a little bit more frightening, mm-hmm. um, they tend to be in places that are abandoned. And a good example of that is the, um, the air base in the Philippines that used to be Clark Field, Clark Air Base. Okay. Uh, that was abandoned by the U.S. military after a volcano erupted and just dumped ash on the entire place. Oh, They've since renovated large parts of it, the runway is usable again. But the hospital, which was state-of-the-art at the time, uh, is still in ruins. And I interviewed Barry Fitzgerald, an Irish paranormal investigator that was a member of the Ghost Hunters International team. Mm -hmm. And Barry said that there is something elemental down in the basement there. Um, And he said that I could not write him a big enough check to spend one more night in that building. (laughs) That that really says something. It does. And yet I think it's independent of the hospital's role. You know, I think that happened to do with the ground that was there many years before the hospital was built in the middle of the 20th century.
Yeah, that that I mean, well, that you have that that sort of phenomenon, that sort of issue with homes all the time too, depending on where a home was built. It, you know, I suppose it could be applicable to a business, a hospital, whatever it is. Uh, what sort of ground are you building on? What was there before? And was it meant for use as anything other than, uh, for example, a burial site? Hmm. It's a valid point, indeed. We tend to look at, especially with newer buildings, we look at the modern hospital and they're very shiny, you know, they're glass, they're perspex, they're stainless steel, they look very high-tech in 21st century. Mm -hmm. But you have to look at the location that they were built on. Are hospitals, especially modern hospitals by nature, are they almost a battery for the paranormal with the amount of electronic medical equipment, very powerful at times, mm. that are you know pulsating throughout them. Uh, you know, I always think of this when people ask about, because uh, obviously I'm in radio, um, you know, a haunted radio station. I have so many stories of those, but, you know, it almost makes mm. sense. You have transmitters, you have this, you have that. Yeah. Very much, I, I think of it mm -hmm. just the, the energy that something can feed off of. A radio station is a great place, as would be a hospital, I would think, at least a modern that, hospital. That's an, that's an excellent point. Um, and you're right, I've heard of a number of haunted radio unexpectedly most of the time, and sometimes violently. And all of that is within this relatively small amount of space. Mm -hmm. And how could that not leave its mark on the environment? You know, you really, you just almost answered my next question, but I want to expand upon it. And that question was, uh, why is it that hospitals are a hotbed for activity? And, and you just explained it all. I mean, it's very much because of what is going on, all of those emotions and the extreme range of all of it. I guess what I want to ask, though, is, okay, so all of these emotions are being expelled in this one place. Why are they staying there? The, the spirit, you mean? Yeah, why is it that, you know, obviously these things happen, but in a lot of cases, especially, you know, if, if it didn't end in, in, in death, and even when it does end in death, the people aren't typically buried on the property. Uh, if it's a, a newborn baby, they go off and they live their life in a, their home. Why is it that so many, uh, so much of this energy, so much of, of these entities or so many of these entities seem to stay in the hospital? That's a great question. And one of the hospitals that I investigated, um, uh, an old hospital outside Salt Lake City in Utah, uh, there, was, there were multiple reports by visiting psychic mediums. There were multiple reports of, there were multiple reports of um, uh, excuse me, uh, a traffic cop, if you will. And that's the term I'm using, of course, as an analogy. Mm -hmm. It was uh, a nurse, the spirit of a nurse, that was actually helping to direct um, those that had passed on supposedly she acted to send them on into the next life the implication being that they needed some kind of help getting there you know so i do wonder if the the spirit some of them may not be earthbound just because of the intensity of emotion that's going on in that location mm -hmm. that that makes sense who who comes back to haunt these places do you see a, an increase in in whether it be patients or staff or both what what have what have you found it was it was definitely a mixture of both. Um, and one thing that I think is, I've seen very commonly researching the book is you look at many medical providers and they don't see it as a job. They see it as a calling or a vocation. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not even a profession. Not to denigrate having a profession, but it's a calling. It's, they're naturally healers. And these are the kind of people that regularly work unpaid overtime, you know, that regularly are in tough situations and that go above and beyond. Sure. Um, and I think it's that kind of mentality, that kind of healer mentality, or I should probably call it healer spirit, if you will, um, that draws the employees back. And I've seen a number of cases in which doctors, nurses, even an x-ray technician um, have been reported both in, in terms of apparitions and EVPs at the hospitals where they once worked in life. And then you have those patients as well that uh, do seem to be earthbound there, and I think they return or, or they stay in residence less voluntarily. Mm -hmm. I was going to ask, I mean, it, it makes sense for, to me anyway, as far as the staff sticking around, because it's one of those things where, and this is true in almost any career um, or, or vocation, if it's something you're extremely passionate about, if it's something that is, is literally an extension of you, it's, mm -hmm. it, it, you, you do seem to see 
more of, of an activity or, or at least, you know, retrospectively, you tend to see uh, more activity within those sort of buildings or locations where those those jobs are being practiced by the people who were the practitioners of, of those those jobs and those those careers um, than you do so much. Today's episode of Real Ghost Stories Online is an encore presentation. We hope you enjoy the show. Hey, it's Tony Brisky from Real Ghost Stories Online. Thank you so much for listening to our program. If you want even more ghost stories, some of the best ones that we get in, then we ask that you join our EPP program, Extra Podcast Person program is what that stands for for only five dollars a month to get all of our bonus episodes more than 80 of them access to the archive of episodes that have fallen off of itunes and exclusive video content as well including our new series seeing ghosts with exclusive ghost photos that are just completely creepy it's only five dollars a month that's what keeps this show funded and on the air if you like what you hear please support us and help keep this thing going sign up at realghoststoriesonline.com and click become an epp welcome to real ghost stories online call in your real ghost story now at 855-853-4802 or write in at realghoststoriesonline.com. You are about to enter the world of the unknown, and quite possibly, the undead. This is Real Ghost Stories Online. If you have to think back on uh, what's one of the most common type places that we get stories from at Real Ghost Stories Online, where would it be? What, what common location seems to be one of the most haunted? Think about it. Think about it. That's right. Hospitals. For whatever reason, hospitals are one of the hottest beds, if you will, of haunting activity. And on today's episode of Real Ghost Stories Online, we're going to talk with Richard Estep, author of the book World's Most Haunted Hospitals. And we're going to talk about just that, some of the most haunted hospitals in the world, why they are the most haunted, and... Uh, who, what, why are uh, spirits drawn to these places? It's going to be a very fascinating hour of real ghost stories online. And I uh, welcome you uh, and thank you for joining us. If you're a new listener, uh, we hope you enjoy this program and be sure to check out our archived shows as well. As uh, this is uh, one of the uh, most listened to paranormal ghost shows uh, out there today, literally Hundreds of episodes just filled with everything uh, you could possibly want in the world of paranormal. You can find more about that on our website, realghoststoriesonline.com. Uh, let's get right into our interview today with uh, Richard Estep. Uh, he is a professional paranormal investigator, several years uh, behind doing that. But uh, I will, I'll let you explain your background a little bit, Richard, and uh, what brought you into the world of the paranormal. Sure. Well, I've had a lifelong fascination with all things paranormal. Ever since I can remember as a boy, I was that kid that when everybody else was out running around playing sports, I would be uh, reading the books that I got from the library about uh, haunted houses and <laughs> ghost stories, you know, starting with the junior stuff, but then going on to some of the weightier books by guys like Peter Underwood and, and Harry Price and some of the American authors, you know, the Warrens. So I've always had a... Sorry. I've always had a fascination with stuff like that. Okay. Um, it's always um, been something I've been desperately interested in. And my grandparents' house was haunted when I was growing up, so they had told me some great first-hand ghost stories that I just was fascinated by. Did you have any experiences yourself in your grandparents' house uh, that were paranormal? You know, I did not have any experiences myself, but it wasn't for lack of, of looking. And I used to... <laughs> I used to lie awake at night terrified that I would encounter the resident um, apparition, which was an old lady that had tucked my, my stepdad and his um, brothers and sisters into bed at night. Oh. Uh, and she was, yeah, she was a very kind of friendly ghost, although it would have, I think if I'd actually met her at that age, it would have scared the pants off of me, you know? Yeah. But uh, <laughs> she seemed to be in residence for as long as there were children in that house. And once they grew up and left and had families of their own, mm -hmm. uh, the apparition stopped coming around. I'm very much like a caregiver type ghost. Yeah, absolutely. A very kind of um, maternal mm -hmm. caring ghost. 
That's a type that you, that you want to have. If you have a ghost, if you have to pick, you know, who's going to be haunting the house, that'll be the good one to have. Until one day you realize, oh, it uh, has a third eye and it happens to be red. What's going on here? <laughs> <laughs> well, let's talk about uh, your your book here, World's Most Haunted Hospitals. I want to ask you this, first off, how how do you define what hospitals are the most haunted? That's the best question yet, and it's one that um, that you really can't answer easily. So calling it the world's most haunted hospital, to be honest, was the publisher's idea. Not that I was against it, but you're making a pretty bold claim. Mm -hmm. Because as you say, how do you define something so subjective? Do you look at a case like, for example, St. Thomas's Hospital in London, which has a very well-documented um, gray lady that goes back generations? Mm -hmm. You know, you've got a, a haunting that is well over a century, consistently old. Or do you go to places that have um, hundreds, if not thousands, of deaths listed in them, uh, and you see kind of bursts of, of paranormal activity? Mm -hmm. and it's, so it's, there's a degree of subjectivity there, Tony, to tell you the truth. Sure. I just, I didn't know if there was a certain, uh, you know, way you were ranking it or not, but a lot of times the publishers, that's what they do. They come up with the, uh, the, the title, it's going to stand out the most, and uh, it certainly does. Now, when we think about a haunted hospital, and we get, we literally get thousands of stories on this show every yeah. single year from all different types of hospital environments, whether it be, you know, an abandoned asylum, which is what, you know, everybody pictures when they think of haunted hospital. Mm -hmm. But we also get a lot of stories uh, that, that come from, you know, active facilities, whether it be a nursing home, whether it just be a, a small clinic of some sort. It's, it's not always the creepy abandoned places that have spirits in it, is it? And I don't think that that's, that's even a fact of the creepiness of it, as much as it's I mean, that's, that's psychological. Mm -hmm. But I've said many times that when it comes down to a hospital, and you can pick any hospital, pick a busy metropolitan hospital, pick one that's in downtown New York or Chicago or London, wherever. Mm -hmm. And if you look at a typical year in the life of a modern hospital, let's say, mm -hmm. you see the entire spectrum of human drama played out on that stage. And so in one part of the hospital, you have joy. You have new life coming into the world. You have babies being delivered families that are being augmented, you know, it's terrific. And that's very intense emotion. Mm -hmm. And then just not that far away, you have lives that are coming to a close. So in some of the longer term care facilities, you know, facilities in the hospital, you have people that have lived 60, 70, 80 years and are breathing their last. And you get grief, you get sadness. And then there's the emergency room where you have lives that are ending. You know, a fast food employee. I mean, obviously, there's not many people who are you know, very much, you know, that is what I was called to do. It's it's very mm -hmm. much the things that are, this is me, this is my life, it will be my life until I die, and of, oftentimes, even then after. So that led me to my next question of uh, about the patients, and you had just said mm -hmm. it too, that maybe they're not so much there by choice, and I was going to ask, are mm -hmm. they there by choice? And if they're not, why? Why are they there, and, and, and what what is keeping them there? Well, I think that, that, just to piggyback on what you said before that, by the way, you're absolutely correct. Um, I've seen a number of haunted firehouses in my career, and as a firefighter, that's, again, a, a, prof a profession. Yeah. It's something you are 24-7, and there's a lot of emotion attached to that family atmosphere. Sure. Uh, so to answer your last question, though, um, I'm not entirely sure that all of them are earthbound in the sense we understand it. I do wonder if some come back in visitation, uh, but for those that are seemingly permanently in residence, there are a number of factors that might be at play, and one could easily be unresolved issues, mm -hmm. which, again, is a fairly common um, motivation, isn't it, when we see a case of a long-term haunting. In fact, going back to the very earliest ghost stories we have recorded, uh, these unresolved issues are absolutely reasons that a spirit can stay earthbound. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a large part of it. Just the unresolved issues. Do you, do you think that that they they are aware that they are stuck? Do you think that a lot of them are aware that they are even dead? Because we, we hear so many cases, and, and it seems to be more common in in a hospital uh, setting, mm -hmm. but more so like in a, a, an assisted living or a, an end-of-life care yeah. type facility, where we hear the stories of someone who resided in a certain room for a couple years before they passed yeah. and then their daily activities whether it be the blanket gets folded in this mm -hmm. specific way or whatever it be 
it continues to repeat itself after they're gone. Sure, and it's a question of is there any intelligence there? Yeah. Are we truly intelligent, or is it more residual? Yeah. And I know I, I encountered some cases, uh, again, looking at some of the London hospitals. One that I won't forget that was really quite sad and yet also helpful is a nurse who um, found herself in a position that no medical professional should ever be in ethically, where she was caring for her own uh, fiancé. Uh, she was his nurse, and she accidentally overdosed him with morphine. <clears throat> and he died. Mm -hmm. And so what's interesting about this particular um, apparition is she's said to appear and nurses see her whenever narcotics are being given, pain medication. And it's almost as though she's still beating herself up emotionally over this single error that she made that ended so badly. Mm -hmm. And she's coming back to say to the, the newest generations of nurses, hey, don't be like me. Check your dose more carefully. You know, Don't make this mistake because mm -hmm. I'm still paying for it. Uh, century later. It's almost as if she's coming back to be a help in, in the hospital. It, it is, but also the affect is very me melancholy, you know. Mm -hmm. You're right, she is being beneficial, but it's it's also very sad that, you know, forgiveness is, is, is something I think we all need to be better at and we could all work harder at. But if you can't forgive yourself after that amount of time, you know, it's a very sad thing. Yeah. How long should you continue to pay yourself for a mistake that was honestly made? And how can how could someone like that be helped to eventually cross over if they're sitting yes, there indeed. still still doing that? Yeah, I, I, I guess that also kind of leads me to the thought of 